Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome once again to the BC203, the local church course. Uh, we're still in section one. Uh, we finished uh, chapter four in the last session. Um, I just wanna, want to quickly uh, run through, do a quick summary of chapter four. Um, so we're all on the same page. Uh, before I continue, am I audible? Am I clear? Everything fine? All right. Cool. So in chapter four, we uh, looked. At, we did a case study of two churches. One is the Jerusalem Church and the Church of Antioch. Uh, we looked at their strengths, uh, their challenges, um, their shortcomings, etc. And then we went into uh, looking at the different stages of growth. Uh, right. So uh, we actually started off that class, I think, with with uh, what our understanding of growth uh, was. Right. Um, so from that perspective, we saw there are different stages uh, for church growth, uh, starting off with the pioneering stage. Um, this is just laying the groundwork, getting our hands dirty, uh, you know, uh, getting to the hard work, laying the groundwork through prayer, intercession, reaching out, building bridges with the community uh, that is being reached, etc. Uh, after the pioneering stage, uh, we see that there is the administrative organized uh, and a structural stage, right? Uh, this is where we establish well-defined systems and process uh, to serve the people, okay? So there is a, a method, a procedure, uh, a flowchart, so to say, okay? Uh, right, do now what you will even do after you have increased in numbers. Um, so plan ahead, be prepared uh, for the future. Uh, the third stage was the pastoral team stage. You're building your pastoral team, the ministry team, um, right? And the equipping stage uh, and the apostolic function stage. So once you have, uh, once you've reached the equipping stage and you've been successful as a church in equipping the saints of your church, uh, you can now start focusing on missions, start going out uh, in the confidence that, uh, you know, your church can, will continue to be equipped uh, even in your absence when you have to be elsewhere and whatnot right so that's the apostolic function stage uh, and then with all through all these stages uh, comes cha uh, changes and challenges uh, and so as a leader uh, you are to lead from the front okay uh, that you are completely uh, convinced and convicted about the changes and it's positive and it's uh, God-led, spirit-led, whatnot. And so you lead the changes and you explain uh, to those who uh, are not questioning, uh, but ask genuine questions about why this change. Okay, so uh, there is a difference between uh, questioning and asking questions. Now you will come across both the kinds of people, uh, you know, when there are changes happening. Uh, right? That's why I'm very emphasizing that very clearly that there is a difference between uh, asking questions and questioning. Okay, um, I leave that to you to um, whatnot. So uh, once that is that uh, done, you constantly move people, you encourage them, uh, you push them uh, towards ministering um, as well. Okay, so you lead the change and whatnot. So that's basically in in a, in a nutshell, chapter four. Okay, uh, now we move into chapter five. What makes a local church strong? Right. What makes a local church strong? Um, so that, that is a question to you all. Uh, what do you think makes a local church strong? Feel free to unmute and speak. I think unity among congregation is one of the greatest strength. Unity among the congregation is great. Okay, uh, guys, uh, officially this lecture is done, so we can, <laughs> uh, you know, I'll end the call and go home and take a day off. Sorry, <laughs> so <good> boom. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks, John. Uh, anything else? Being rooted in work. Uh, okay, work or word? Uh, both. Okay. The presence of the supernatural. 
the presence of the supernatural. Okay, thank you. Strong leadership. Zelitoli says strong leadership and balanced uh, in word and spirit. I guess what you'll have for breakfast time today? Huh? Some good answer juice or something. <laughs> nice, nice. Okay, yeah. You just speak to me. Um, it's, this is a question for everybody. What makes a local church strong? We heard unity being rooted in word, strong leadership, and balance in word and spirit. Yeah. Made my life easier. What is Aradhana? Sid. Roslyn, Georgia. We are all part of a local church, I hope. Spending quality time with God, yeah. Uh, so spending quality time with God. Uh, so as individuals uh, and community, or oh, oh, what exactly was it? We're talking about the local church. So Zelitoli, anything else? Subashish, Leah. Working together, not just different from the pastors, but we as volunteers working together with the church for the development. So, volunteers working together uh, for the development and serving makes the local church strong. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thanks for sharing. Reaching out to the lost, raising up leaders. Okay, guys, seriously, like, what did y'all have for breakfast? Huh? Like, so. <laughs> uh, it's Friday. Evangelism and winning souls. Yeah, pastor of the local church who spent time with God for divine guidance. Yeah, okay. And the pastor of the local church should spend time with God for divine guidance. Everybody else can chill out and take a chill pill. <laughs> cool. Yeah, uh, but thanks, guys. Like, I mean, like I uh, said, great answers. Um, I, now I'm wondering if I should even just go ahead with this lesson and stuff. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, yeah, being just part of a local church uh, is, helps us uh, see, have a different kind of a perspective on what can make a church strong, you know, overall. So there are so many perspectives, right? So many, uh, like, reasons that, you know, everything, what you mentioned, like the, from the leadership uh, to balance between word and spirit spirit being rooted in the word uh, reaching out to the lost raising up leaders uh, evangelism and winning souls uh, being able to spend time with god building that intimate relationship yeah i mean it's just 100 out of 100 uh, for all of these things all these points right uh, um so thank you for sharing that um but and from your notes if you're looking at the pdf from page 33 uh, one of the first thing that starts off um, is uh, the, some of the important characteristics uh, of a strong local church. Uh, just to highlight a few things, which is already being mentioned uh, by all, is uh, the first thing is um, a church where there is strong leadership uh, with a God-given vision. Strong leadership with a God-given vision. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Now again, we uh, we've seen in, uh, enough of life, I think, uh, for us to understand what uh, a strong leadership is. So once again, a question for all of us uh, is: How would you define uh, strong leadership? What does strong leadership look like to you? Uh, 
and also as an exercise, uh, I know you'll be giving me the answers, but I want you to make a note of the answers, your answer. Okay, because uh, you're going to be a leader. You are already a leader. And um... come on, come on, come on, talk to me. <laughs> yeah, John, uh, very easy, convenient. <laughs> <laughs> from a recent uh, leadership summit, the four C's of leadership summit. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Lubega, go ahead. I think a great leader must be in ministry with career goals and vision. Uh, and when he is called by God, I don't think that the leader should be in leadership for the right reasons, not for the wrong ones because usually they don't put their they always come putting on paper different reasons yet uh -huh. inside they have different right. ones yeah thanks thank you thanks for sharing that yeah um, so oh, oh, okay uh, here here's another question right so you chose the words a uh, great leader um, so what's the difference between a strong leader and a great leader That's a question again for all of us, and I'm I'm hoping that you all are all thinking. <laughs> um, yes, sir, Enoch. A great leader is the one that's appointed by God elected by men but a strong leader is the one who appointed himself because he feel like he's strong he's stronger than everybody can put himself there a strong hmm. leader strong leader is the one that if field is strong enough he can be in that position for anything no matter what it is but a great leader is someone again that because of what he has people know that yes this can deliver because okay. of his character attitude and the fear of god make him to be great okay today Example today, we see some people who call themselves a very strong leader, mm -hmm. but there has nothing to deliver. They've never mm -hmm. feared God. Okay. David is a great leader because God chose him. Okay. But those who are strong, they never fear God because they feel that they have everything. So I prefer a great leader who is because fear of God. Thank That's you. Your um, so yeah, again, uh, a counter question maybe. So when we say that in this section, a church where there is strong leadership uh, with God-given vision. Um, so what what would that mean? Shouldn't we have? Shouldn't churches have strong leaders or? Uh, Okay, but I get that's your definition, that's your understanding of strong leadership. Uh, but anything else? Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Yes. Um, okay. For now, no. Hey, Rosalind, anything else? Yeah. Hello? Yes, he said maybe church should have a strong leader. Uh, uh, my opinion who is a strong leader hmm. because if we must define someone that is strong in terms of what is he strong is he administrative is it fear of god so i think um 
A church shouldn't have a strong leader, but they should have a great leader with a vision who see an aid. You okay. may be strong at what level, but when you are great, your impact will be felt. Okay. So church should have a great leader, not a strong leader. To my but opinion. I'm all right, thanks, success. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I like what uh, Collins has also shared here. Um, a strong and a great leader are both sides of the same coin. Um, yeah, I think yeah, that's a good point there. Uh, Rosalind says, a great leader will always give a birth to great leaders like him. Wow, okay, there's some serious leadership development uh, plan there. Uh, yeah, okay, awesome. Well, great, guys. So from uh, everything that is mentioned there, right, uh, the, the statement that follows there is a church where there's strong leadership with a God-given vision. Um, so you can say that a leadership is probably strong if that leadership has a vision from God, right, if they've received uh, a, a vision from God. So it is important to have a God-given vision of what the Lord wants to do in and through the local church. And if the church leadership is clear of that, then you can kind of label them as, okay, yeah, they're, you know, to a certain extent, you have a strong leadership. Uh, right? So that's kind of a, a point one of the basic uh, thing. Uh, but, uh, and then the next thing is, it's followed by vision, right? Like just as we spoke, um, a dictionary defines vision as a uh, a vivid uh, to imaginative conception or anticipation, uh, right? A vivid to imaginative conception or anticipation. That's the de def dictionary definition. Uh, but like what I would like, I, I I would like to prefer to define it as a goal that you have set out to accomplish. A simple terms. That's just so that I understand, right? Um, a goal that you, it's set out uh, that you have to accomplish, um, right? So Proverbs twenty nine eighteen says, "Without uh, without this vision, we are unproductive." Um, right? So Proverbs twenty nine eighteen. So we know that. Uh, another uh, simple example, like uh, the way I like to think, is uh, um, if you don't have a vision, uh, you're like you're running on a treadmill. Right. I mean, <laughs> I mean, running on a treadmill physically is not necessarily a bad thing. Okay, we uh, we, we we've all seen it. We, uh, I've used it uh, to uh, exercise or whatnot. But <laughs> uh, figuratively, metaphorically speaking, uh, you know, if, if you don't have a vision and if you're only doing things, uh, you know, getting certain things okay let's do this event because it sounds good let's do that event because it looks good let's do this thing without a proper vision or an end goal of what you want to accomplish uh, then it's like you're just running on a treadmill a lot of activities a lot of movements but then uh, you're not really going anywhere you're very stationary right so uh the vision begins with the leader if the leader has no clear vision uh, then it is just like the blind leading the blind, um, right? So, uh, how many of you would agree that vision is kind of important? <laughs> yes, no, maybe. Yeah. Uh, how many of you have uh, seen uh, or encountered a blind eye doctor? Or a blind doctor that wants to perform a surgery. <laughs> Would you trust a a a, a blind uh, eye doctor or anyone who would want to perform a surgery on you? I'd be a little nervous. I will not. I will <laughs> not try to release myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, you know. Yeah. So uh, I think we are all in agreement, and uh, you know, to know in, in coming to a consensus, saying that a vision is very important. It, it's to say the least, uh, right? Um, is 
it's one thing to lead without having a vision and then uh it's another thing to lead uh by having you know with a vision in mind and the next thing is uh as a leader we must communicate the vision clearly to people so that people can know where god is leading all of us okay so the next thing is yeah you'd have strong leadership and strong leadership you will will know the vision of god and the next thing is you will be able to communicate that very clearly to your team and eventually to the congregation of where god wants us to uh, god wants us to go right um there's just a small example uh, i'm not sure if it's very uh, uh relatable but then uh, i was me being part of a band or, or a worship team that i was part of with five of us in a team uh, the worship leader or the lead vocalist uh, of the band uh, uh, you know, before we go into rehearsal or practicing or whatnot, he would send us the song list. And just before we enter into the time of practice or rehearsal, he would sit with us and he will tell us uh, why he has chosen those songs. Uh, you know, it's not like, okay, he just randomly picked songs, put it together. Uh, but he said, okay, I, I put these songs together because this is what God was talking to me. And I feel like this is where God wants to take us. And so me as a band member or a team of, you know, a part of a, a team, okay, now I know, okay, this is where uh, he wants to go because this is where God has told him uh, to go. And so now as a, uh, as a team member, uh, I have the trust. Okay, I'm going to follow him because he knows where he is going. Uh, and if me as you know as a person if i didn't know where he's going then i would be very nervous uh, and i've been in situations like that and it's not a very pleasant situation uh, right so it's important to have uh, for the leadership to have a clear vision and then to be able to communicate that vision uh, with the uh, with the team and eventually the congregation right um, if the shepherd fails the sheep scatters uh, as we say see it in zechariah chapter 13 uh, verse 7 Right? And also in Isaiah 9, 16, for the leaders of this people cause them to err, and those who are led by them are destroyed. Uh, this is an example of uh, uh, a bad leadership, a weak leadership. Right? Uh, and I guess, uh, I mean, I would encourage you to uh, listen to uh, the sermon series of uh, leadership that was uh, completed last month uh, by uh, APC. Pastor Ashish, and if you have access to that, and all the notes are all available. Uh, he spoke on the four C's of leadership, um, and it's just brilliant uh, series, right? Uh, so I would encourage you to take a look at it. Um, okay, so that's the first thing. The next thing is a church where there is a balanced emphasis on the word and spirit. Uh, like I said, all your answers were like, okay, you went through the notes and then you gave me the answers. I won't be surprised if you all actually went through the notes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, we are strengthened by the word and by the work of the Holy Spirit. Right? We are strengthened by the word and the work of the Holy Spirit. Right? Um, so in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, uh, he says that that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That's what it says, right? So he strengthens us by his spirit, okay? So um, we need to, as again, Rosalind mentioned that we need to build that intimate relationship uh, with him where our spirit man is built. But at the same time, we, uh, you know, we just, uh, feed us uh, with the word of God, right? Um, and I mean, we are all Bible college students. We all know the importance of the word. And I can't stress enough of the importance and the, the significance um, uh, and just reading um, the word of God. <clears throat> in Colossians 3, 16 or something, I think it says, let the word of Christ rich in you dwell, uh, you know, dwell in you richly, um, right? So, and yeah, I mean, for us to just, there are a lot of battles have been fought over this book um right uh, a lot of a lot of people have been killed uh, martyred uh, you know in in, pres in preserving this book over the years thousands of years thousands of years and many people have wanted to destroy this book uh, to say the least um, but none of them have succeeded uh, i feel like god preserved this book 
for such a time as this and he knew okay you know on the 26th of august uh you know, one of my sons or daughters is going to open up this book and he's going and he's going to search in my word to be encouraged and so he's preserved it for us um right um so I can't stress enough, and I've done this activity. I've spoken about this uh, thing that my mentor asked me to do um, a long back in 2008 or something. Is uh, he asked me to go to Psalm 119, uh, and it says, uh, and he he said, uh, you know, there are about 175 verses in that psalm, and every verse uh, of that psalm, uh, 176, sorry. And I'm just looking. Um, I use an NIV. Um, um, so this psalm, in every verse, it will have these words. Uh, it will have the words law, statutes, ways, precepts, decrees, um, commands, um, what is promise, um, word. Again, and you will see, and you will see those words being repeated in every single verse and all of those different words um, simply mean god's word right precepts uh, decrees statues ways i mean your translation might have something else like uh, testimonies uh, and whatnot but then uh, and they call this uh, psalm psalm 118 a love poem uh, to god's law um, so that's the beauty of god's word um, god's word and god's spirit uh, God's word cleanses us, uh, the scripture says, right? In uh, in James, uh, you know, his word, his word is like a mirror. It also shows us uh, who we are and then how it empowers us to be different, um, right? So God's word is important, guys, to say the least. So a church where there is a balanced emphasis on the word of God and spirit, um, right? Okay, let's go to the next page, page 34. As we do this, there are five focus areas where we need to strengthen the local congregation. The five focus areas, uh, one is evangelism, discipleship, prayer and worship, fellowship and equipping for ministry. Okay, so we're talking about what makes a local church strong. We started off by understanding uh, strong leadership uh, and the strong leadership will always have a God-given vision and a strong leadership will always communicate the God-given vision to uh, their team and their congregation, um, right? And a strong local church will have will be uh, will have a good balance uh, and emphasize on the Word of God and the Spirit of God, right? Um. So having considered all of that, uh, what are a few more things that uh, builds and strengthens the local church? Are these the uh, these five things? Uh, evangelism. Uh, we equip God's people to share the gospel and win others to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, the local church should continually reach out to the unsaved in many ways. Now, the first line there: we equip God's people to share the gospel. Um, I think that's uh, very important. Uh, now, it's very easy for the leadership just to say, "Okay, you have to share the gospel, evangelize, share the gospel, evangelize." Um, it's one thing, and and the people will be lost and will not do uh, you know it will not step into evangelism or if they are not taught how to do it and that's why we have this course called lifestyle evangelism isn't it uh, i think was that in the first year um, right and then endless resources online as to how to evangelize uh, and and whatnot so uh, it's very important for us to equip uh, God's people, uh, the people of your church, uh, of your local church, on how to share the gospel. Um, there are strategies, there are methods, uh, you know, that you can follow, uh, which has been tried and tested, um, etc. So once they are equipped, now their their confidence is a little better than before. It's like, okay, so let me just try this. Let me try this method and see if I can use that to evangelize. So now they feel equipped and by being equipped, they also feel empowered to share the gospel. All right, that is individually speaking and uh, and also collectively. And now once that confidence level is uh, reached, the collective church, the local church should continually reach out to the unsaved in many ways. Uh, 
I was having a coffee with my friend, uh, with a friend of mine yesterday. Uh, he was talking about uh, uh, how the uh, you know the political climate uh, in India currently doesn't allow us to be so free as uh, as it used to be, at least a little free. Okay, uh, and then he was talking about how his friend started a, like a cafe, and he's a missionary, and he's uh, how he, how he's always hiring um, the the less fortunate. Uh, you know, people and how he equips them, he trains them how to make coffee, uh, and then uh, you know, disciples them uh, and you know, shares the gospel with them and whatnot. So, uh, that's like you know, thinking out of the box kind of a thing, isn't it? So, we have to start thinking of uh, what, what are there different methods or ways beyond street evangelism and, and whatnot, you know, that we can use to share the gospel. Uh, and and as we continue to lean on God's heart uh, to hear from him, he gives us the strategies, uh, the wisdom, the courage uh, to evangelize, right? And the second thing is a discipleship. Uh, a disciple is one who has been trained to be Christ-like in character, conduct and service character conduct and uh, service now if you want to learn more about discipleship <laughs> again guys this is not a new uh, topic at all uh, for the church <laughs> uh, and ministry uh, every second ministry is talking about it uh, you know how to make disciples a discipleship program uh, what not so uh, Get your hands on a good thing. I came across a good teacher, and uh, let me share if I can. Um, so um, he's uh, Ray Vanderland. Uh, you can listen to him when possible. Um, he's uh, I like his way and his understanding of discipleship. It's it's, it's pretty deep and it's pretty neat. You can check him out when you can. Okay. Uh, so this method or this process of discipleship is where we train and equip uh, our church members uh, to be more like Christ in character, in conduct, and service. Basically, our lifestyle should reflect uh, and look like Jesus. That's basically what it is. Um, and then as a congregation, we must continuously increase in prayer and worship. Uh, God. Right. Um, I'm not sure if I again share this, but uh, what's this? Yeah. So uh, this book by E. M. Bounds. Uh, uh, you can get this the complete works of E. M. Bounds. Um, he is one of uh, well-established uh, authors on prayer. Um, I can't stress enough on you know uh, the importance of prayer. Again, we are all Bible college students. We all know the importance of prayer. Um, so. Push your congregation, uh, you know, to increase in prayer and uh, worship, right? Because prayer and worship create an atmosphere for spiritual ministry as we gather, right? So we grow uh, together as a church uh, by, you know, continuously, uh, um, you know, having this time of prayer and worship and whatnot, uh, you are building a culture. Uh, right, and that culture is simply a culture of prayer and worship. Uh, you know, everybody who steps into the church who will eventually will know, okay, hey, this church is a praying church, um, right? So they emphasize on the word, they emphasize on the spirit, they emphasize on worship, they emphasize on prayer. It's like on complete package kind of thing, you know, a uh, good package, right? And then fellowship. Fellowship is simply living out in daily life the relationship we have as sons and daughters of God. Uh, we are part of the same family and we live this out in real practical ways by caring for one another, supporting, helping, and nurturing uh, one another. Uh, and equipping for ministry. That's the last point, is equipping for ministry. Every member must be fully equipped activated and released to fulfill their calling right it's again going back to that uh, verse in ephesians chapter 4 verse 16 uh, that every saint uh, to be equipped uh, right so every member must be fully equipped activated and released to fulfill their calling 
and we begin by helping believers understand that each one has a place and function in the body of Christ. Um, and this is something that we emphasize at APC, uh, is we say that time and time again, is that every member, every believer uh, is a minister of God, right? And you heard me say that uh, enough uh, time that, okay, it's the ministry of healing and deliverance is not only for pastors or the pastoral team, it's for every member. And so what we do, if, if that is the goal, if that's the vision that we are going for, that every member is to uh, minister in healing and deliverance, what are we going to do? Right? Okay, so we have these weekend schools of ministries, uh, uh, right? weekend schools on healing and deliverance, where we equip uh, our saints, we equip our church members on how to minister in healing and deliverance. And now we say, okay, hey, you guys have been equipped. You begin to uh, minister in healing and deliverance. Um, right, so you, you see uh, where this where this is going, right? So you equipping, you're equipping them for ministry, and that's the goal. Uh, is that every member uh, ministers, and what what do you do to equip them is up to you, right? Um, so these are the five um, simple focus areas on how to strengthen uh, your local church congregation. Uh, you know, tomorrow God calls you to plant a church uh, and whatnot. So evangelism, discipleship prayer and worship, fellowship, equipping um, for ministry, right? Um, so uh, any thoughts or questions at this point? OK. And there is this uh, uh, video lesson series on discipleship by Ray Vanderland, the person that I've mentioned. Uh, it's called the In the Dust of the Rabbi. And that's what his discipleship uh, video lesson series are called. Um, such a cool title, In the Dust of the Rabbi. Let's see, check it out when you can. OK, so uh, we're now moving on to page uh, 35. Preparing for pulpit ministry. Okay, um, keeping the above five areas in mind, we must take our ministry from the pulpit very seriously. Okay, uh, and Pastor writes, each opportunity we have to stand behind the pulpit to minister God's word and the work of His Holy Spirit must be done with definite purpose. Okay, every opportunity that we have to speak the word of God and to minister and the work of his Holy Spirit must be done with definite purpose. That means there has to be a clear vision. Okay, we are not just filling up our time in Sunday service or a weekly service. I say, okay, you know, we just have this 30 minutes of sermon after worship time. I'm just going to put on something and, uh, you know, just move on. Um, it's, oh, I see Paul has raised his hand. Uh, yes, Paul. Hi, Paul, do you have a question? I guess not. OK. <laughs> uh, all right, so. Right, so preparing for pulpit ministry, each time we minister, we are nurturing uh, people in one of these five areas. Um, so time and time again, you, you, we come across this word called nurture, right? Uh, what does that mean, uh, nurture? What does it mean to nurture? Sorry, Isaac, you said something? I didn't quite... Yeah. To me, it means to help something to grow. Nurture is to help something to grow like a, like a plant. Yeah, mm. you, 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 know, you, you, you water it, you are helping it to grow. That is, you're nurturing the plant. Thank you. 
Yeah, thanks, Isaac. Thank you. Yeah, that's wonderful. He said, yeah, you you take care of the plant. You're taking care of something, someone, um, right? You're helping it to grow. It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, and you nurture it. Um, to raise up something out of someone to become better, to achieve full potential. Uh, that's a nice one, Collins. Thank you for sharing. To raise up, okay, to raise up something out of someone to become better to achieve full potential wow okay that's uh, pretty deep so you uh you know if as a worship leader i see a potential in an individual uh saying okay this person has just joined the worship team but i see a lot of potential in that person uh you, you, you that, that this person can go from here to there uh and as a good leader i'm not just going to recognize that and not do anything about it but as a good leader i would begin to nurture it's like okay hey what can i do to help you because this is what i see in you you are here but you you have the potential to be here and i'm more than willing to take you up here uh, you know are you willing so that's that's nurturing isn't it so um, each time we minister as the notes says we are nurturing people in one of these five areas every time we minister uh, from wherever not necessarily from the pulpit but in this in this context we're talking about the pulpit we are nurturing we are growing we are helping people grow right we are equipping the saints uh, to grow in maturity isn't it um and so pastor has mentioned and uh, put down a few pointers uh, he likes to balance the teaching and preaching of God's word across three areas. Uh, you'll see a short uh, image there with three pillars. Uh, one is Christian life, life skills, and ministry. Okay, so Christian life, life skills, and ministry. So uh, what he does is he plans the whole year out. Uh, I still remember my, in my early days of uh, when I joined as a youth pastor in 2018, um i was asking him is like, okay how do you come up with the sermon topics pastor uh <laughs> you know you have to preach every sunday and whatnot so he broke it down very simple uh, and he said okay there are about 53 weeks in a, in a year 53 54 50, you know give or take right um and there are so many topics that i can speak on but i only have say 52 um uh, sundays to share um to speak in the, in a given calendar year, uh, that's not enough. And so for him, that was not enough. <laughs> and so uh, he planned this whole calendar uh, out around these three things: uh, teaching. He balanced it out between teaching and preaching. One with Christian life, which uh, teaching people how to live the Christian life. Uh, example: developing disciplines in of prayer, reading God's word, uh, walk of faith, authority, who we are in Christ uh right so you, you see the topics that's being chosen there it's about building us uh you know our spiritual lives our spirit man um uh, isn't it that's about discipleship like being uh, we are being equipped with those topics um and then uh choose topics are related to life skills teaching people how to live uh, god's word in daily situations example school colleges make decisions marriage uh, so how do i take what i have learned on a sunday or from the word of god and apply it into my daily life um right so we we talk about david being a good shepherd okay now how can i take that and put into context of my life uh right so uh, the, i used to teach the, the youth on something called the soap um method one is the scripture then you have observation um, then you have application and then you, and you pray so you take a piece of scripture uh, take a piece of scripture you take a, a, a portion of scripture uh, let's take uh, matthew chapter 5 say uh, we are called to be the salt and light of the city so you've read that scripture and you observe it okay uh, what are you say okay what are what are all the things that the salt is good for uh, you know, salt is used for what? What does the light do? You've observed that. You've kind of studied. You've you meditated on it, and then you ask yourself, how can I apply that verse in my daily life, right? Uh, how can I be? What does it mean for me to be a salt and light uh, where God has placed me? And then I pray. It's like, 
okay god uh, help me to be a salt and light uh, where I'm at. so um, that's what that's where life skill comes in right so you have the clear progression of there's a teaching on christian life and then uh, we are called to go and live a life of a christian and the third pillar is ministry uh, that is teaching people how to minister and serve others with the anointing of god and the gifts of the spirit okay uh, anointing uh, anointing of god and the gifts of the spirit so this is where uh, uh, what i just mentioned uh, some time ago is about uh, topics like healing and deliverance uh, pastor did a whole series actually he did he went through that entire book what we went through last year last semester uh, it was you guys right uh, yeah, healing and deliverance um, so he had a full sermon series on healing and deliverance went through the whole book for the entire church uh, that is the ministry part uh, of the topic right? where the whole church he wanted to equip the whole church and remind them that they are that they are all to minister in healing and deliverance that's just an example okay um so and why is this important why uh, you know just breaking it out uh, like this is important because he's mentioned isaiah chapter 46 verse 10 which says uh, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times uh, times things are not yet done saying my counsel shall stand and i will do all my pleasure declaring the end from the beginning now so god knows the end from the beginning Right, he declares the end from the beginning, and so his inspiration is. Uh, so I seek the inspiration not just for one sermon, but for the entire year. So as a shepherd of a church, uh, you know we don't just seek God for that Sunday, which is fine and good, but uh, you know God has a plan for an entire year. He has a because he already knows the end from the beginning. He declares the end from the beginning, as we've just read in the scriptures. Right, so. Um, as leaders, you know, if you want to, you, know, you can just balance it out the way it's balanced it up in the in the notes and plan the entire year for your church. Uh, and all of this, again, just to remind us, is to uh, strengthen your local church. Right. So uh, I think I'll I'll pause here uh, and we'll take a uh, ten minutes break and uh, we'll resume in the next session. Argus, I'll see you all in 10.